small come back to crack classroom. It has been a few hours since I last recorded and I'm finally ready to film. Seventeen hundred to nineteen hundred medicine. Now this took a while because um, let's just say I thought the Western Front was the longest uh, section of this chapter, but it's not. It's not. Um, I had to go for this. So yeah, this is going to be a hefty video, whereas the other ones were like twenty minutes long, almost thirty. This one might it might take a while. Uh, so let's start now. So Georgian and Victorian times. Uh, we start with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so this all happened because the Industrial Revolution before it was more rural and people used agriculture to uh, get food. But now, due to the Industrial Revolution, they're using machinery. And so if it's Industrial Revolution, you're going to want to go to London. And London is an urban area. So introducing something called urbanisation. Yeah, urbanization uh, meant that crowded housing, because they had the flat, isn't it? Yeah, people shared houses. Okay, there was multiple families in one house, and this was all due to the Industrial Revolution. And it also meant because uh, they were all pooping uh, near the water supplies, it meant that the water got infected with cholera and at this time there was a political change in heart so in the 1800s parliament thought that health was up to the people but when we get later on in this georgian victorian time period we'll find that in the 1900s the government began to install laws so that people would look after themselves because they realized oh they don't have any money to look after themselves so we're gonna have to do it for them uh, but anyway, we're going to get into this. So, they found links between microorganisms and disease in this time, and chemists discovered uh, that they could make anaesthetic. So that's kind of like the summary of what this is going to be. So, during this time period, new tech is developed, or new technology. Uh, so, for example, they got thinner syringes uh, made of the iron was made of need the needle was made of iron uh, meaning that it didn't break so it wasn't you weren't going to inject someone and it wasn't going to snap off uh, also if you placed it down it wasn't going to snap off by the way they were still reusing instruments at this point so they've injected one person so we're going to reuse it um also, there was improvement to glass making, so they had purer glass, uh, which led to better microscope lenses. Uh, also, medicine became a business in this point of time. They realised, hey, <laughs> we could make a business out of this. So they start investing money into medicine. We'll get into that more later. Also, war ramped up the progression. So these are just the things that Im made it progress. Uh, there was also improved communication, because the first railway was made uh, so we have trains now we have the steam engine uh, so doctors can gather at conferences and by the 1900s there was actually a train that took you from london to edinburgh in nine hours now that's kind of revolutionary at this point because they're having to walk everywhere get some horses and carriages you know but now they have trains they have steam engines wow this also led to the great smog, but whatever. Um, anyway, they also now had newspapers. So literacy is increasing. Not by much, but it's increasing. More people are literate, so they're introducing newspapers. Okay, no more Galen and Hippocrates. You don't have to remember them anymore. Fuck them off. No more Galen, no more Hippocrates. Well, a bit of Hippocrates, because you, you still have the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, and you still have observation, but for humans, it's gone. We're done with it. Goodbye. Uh, 
Vesalius had proved Galen wrong, and people had finally started to accept that Galen was wrong. Uh, also, microscopes made his work irrelevant. People now had microscopes. They could look at the things and see, oh my god, Galen was completely wrong. Also, no more church. Well, there's still church, but people didn't believe in it as much, and the church had lost a lot of power, so it's no longer heresy to cut people open. Uh, or dissect. Uh... Knowledge of the world. Uh, people discovered that ancient ideas, like the four humours, were wrong. So they were kind of like, <laughs> we don't need you anymore. Shut up. They now have books all over the place. Because printing press was invented. That was back in the Renaissance. Uh, anyway, we come on to our first key individual. There is a few key individuals in here, but I will tell you when they are key individual. Uh, we have a key individual. His name is Edward Jenner, or Jenner. And he was a doctor. And he invented the first vaccine. And he named it vaccine after the the Latin word for cow, which is vacca, uh, spelled V-A-C-C-A. Uh, and he made it vaccine. He got... He made the first vaccine because inoculation was popular, but he realised, hey, this seems kind of ineffective. And he realised, while he was staring at the milkmaids, doing the doing the thing, milkmaids are doing the thing, and he's peeking around the corner, and he's like, oh, hot damn, that was hot. Wait, why don't they have smallpox? And he realised that smallpox could be combated by cowpox, because all the milkmaids had already gotten cowpox from the cows, and now they didn't need... Uh, inoculation because they couldn't catch smallpox so he uh, did some experiments uh, in the 1790s uh, he did 20 he used 23 cases um, and he also tried it on the little boy do you remember that little boy that he was watching uh, the creepy video where it's like the history guy and he's following him around in a circle uh, so yeah and in 19 in 1798 uh, he published a book on his findings uh, also, vaccines were less dangerous than inoculation, uh, and it was a dead version of the bacteria. You need to know Edward Jenner anyway for our actual science in biology, uh, but you also need to know it for history. Uh, then you have inoculations. Inoculations were used uh, beforehand, and they were much more dangerous. An inoculation was getting scabs of people who had smallpox, putting, crushing them up with mortar and pestle, putting them in a little tube, and down someone's nose. Kind of gross. Kind of grim. It was basically just giving people smallpox and it killed them. Uh, people had smallpox when they were fighting uh, the War of Independence in America and that's why it was kind of halted because people were fucking dying and they couldn't figure out the best approach but that's irrelevant. Uh, so yeah, uh, in the 1700s people paid to be inoculated by doctors. Inoculation was not free whereas vaccines were free when they were introduced. Uh, People went against uh, Jenner's ideas uh, because they were scared that they'd grow cow heads or they'd turn into a cow. Uh, this was made fun of by a satirical artist called James Guillory, or just Guillory, um, and he depicted in 1802 uh, a satirical drawing of people in St Pancras uh, Hospital getting the vaccine and like cow heads coming out of them uh, but of course that didn't happen because that's not how this works um anyway the death rate decreased when vaccines were introduced and they were safer than inoculations so vaccines were made free uh, jenna really pushed for them to become free and they were free and it showed the value of scientific method because jenna had used observation and he'd come to a conclusion and he'd made it but there is one pretty big problem with Jenner's findings. He didn't know how to reproduce it. So he died without saying how to reproduce it because he never found out. He didn't know. He had no clue. He just did it and left. That was it. Um, so limits of this are... Uh, doctors made money from inoculation, so they weren't very keen on introducing vaccines because they couldn't get any money from it. Um, and also, it wasn't made compulsory until 1871. 1871 is when vaccines 
uh, for smallpox became compulsory, um, and it didn't lead to any other discoveries because they couldn't replicate it, because Jenna was kind of like, um, I've done this, but I don't know how to redo it, so I'm just gonna leave you guys, bye, I'm dead now. Uh, anyway, moving on to our next key individual. So we've had Jenna, and now we're on to our next one, who's Jon Snow, not the guy from Game of Thrones. Jon Snow discovered cholera was being spread by the Broad Street Pump, which was giving contaminated water from the Thames because people were offloading all the shit and chemical waste into the Thames. So the Thames at this point was very stinky uh, and they were drinking this water. Uh, and remember that picture of the deft dispensary where it was the guy, the skeleton in his little thing and he's he's pushing down the water pump and people are drinking it and there's a bunch of dead people all, the, all, all around. It's Death's Dispensary is what it came known as. Uh, due to the Industrial Revolution, uh, there was negative impacts on health because uh, it was dirty and it was crowded and it was a breeding ground for disease practically. So yeah, Jon Snow and the Broad Street Pump. We'll get more into that later. Uh, we have a third key individual, Chadwick. Uh, in 1842, he published the report report on sanitary conditions of the labouring population, and it was full of statistics, and it showed the difference in the average age of death from people from a rural to an urban area. So rural workers had the average uh, like death age of 38 years old, which is young, but when you get to urban, you'll be like, oh shit, the urban worker age of death the average was 15 years old and that's because people were getting their hands stuck in machines it was dirty they were getting diseases they were dying uh, then this led to the introduction of the 1848 public health act there are multiple public health acts but this is our first one uh, the public health act was not compulsory so this is our not compulsory one um, and it introduced the national board of health uh, where the and where the death rate was rising, uh, they forced local councils to uh, improve water supply, sewage, and introduce medical officers uh, of health. Uh, and local councils were encouraged to, keyword encouraged to, so not compulsory, they don't have to do it, collect taxes to pay for improvements. Of course, a lot of wealthy people did not want to pay their taxes to help these poor people, because why should they help the poor people? Kind of like now. Um, anyway, so to prevent cholera, they tried to burn barrels of vinegar because they still believed in miasmas at this point because no one had proved them otherwise. Onto the other side of the sheet. But Jon Snow swoops in once again and he publishes a book saying that cholera was from water. He didn't know why it was from water, but he knew it was from water because he had like triangulated all of the pumps and he like totaled all the deaths and he was like, it's this one. So he went to the Broad Street pump and he removed the handle. He, he took it clean off and he was like, no more water for you guys. And they were like, hey, what the fuck have you done? And he was like, hey, you got to listen to me. You're going to die if you drink the water. And guess what? Less people died. Um, and if you remember that weird video of the guy walking around London and there's the slab in the street and it's a different colour and it says in the slab that this was where the Broad Street pump was. Um, also all around that area there's uh, pubs called Jon Snow and not the Game of Thrones guy but this dude, our doctor. He also did a lot of other things. We'll be coming back to him later because he's going to do something else. Uh, the wealthy did not want to pay taxes, that benefited the poor, and so in 1878, the Public Health, Health Act was passed. Yes, another one. And it was compulsory this time for local councils to improve conditions. Uh, in 1875, they took action due to Pasteur's germ theory. We're coming, we're coming, we're improving, okay? Uh, he said... What he said with the germ theory made miasmas fade away as a cause of disease. Uh, and it also caused people to pay tax because they were like, hey, this is a bit terrifying. Let's pay taxes now. Uh, 
The microscope was improved in the 1800s with purer glass, and in 1830s, Joseph Lister. Ooh, it's another person who's quite important. By the way, uh, Pasteur is another key individual. Uh, we've also got Joseph Lister. Uh, he's introduced now, but we're going to get more into him later. I think you remember him. But in the 1830s, Joseph Lister made magnif uh, reached a magnification of a thousand times uh, without distortion. And then we have the French scientist, Louis Pasteur, who introduced the germ theory. Uh, he disproved spontaneous generation, which was the previous theory, uh, that organisms are a result of decay. Decaying matter turns in to living organisms. But no, this wasn't right. Louis Pasteur and his germ theory stated that living organisms are from the air and they cause decay. Okay. Due to this findings, life expectancy rose, but people still used home remedies. So we're seeing a bit of progression, but not a lot. Uh, 1861, germ theory was published. Then we have Robert Koch, who's introduced to the mix. And Robert Koch was a German microbiologist, the first of its kind. Um, and he proved a link between bacteria and human disease by applying Pasteur's germ theory. Uh, he found bacterium that caused anthrax and over 20 more years, uh, he and other scientists discovered more bacterium and made more vaccines. Uh, Pasteur also made more vaccines. Uh, he made the first one after Jenna. He was the first one to make a vaccine after Jenna because he kind of figured it out. And he actually published it this time. He wrote it down. Uh, and this prevented anthrax and chicken cholera. So these were the two scientists that were going against each other, and this is because war. War was happening, and the Germans and the French, it was the Franco-Prussian War, which encouraged Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur to fight against each other to do scientific developments, because if they're losing out on the battlefield, they want to win inside the lab. Uh, then we have Robert Liston. He's another one. Uh, He's not, he's kind of key, but he's not really key. Uh, but we, he focused on his speed of amputation. Uh, he could amputate a leg in two and a half minutes. Uh, and his catchphrase was, time me gentlemen. He got people to get their pocket watches out and time him while he cut someone's leg off. He did this with no anaesthetic and he never washed his hands, ever. He didn't wear gloves. He just wore normal clothes and he just started sticking his hands in people cutting the legs off uh, and his patients usually died from the shock and the pain because there was no anesthetic being used introduction to another key individual and he's actually a key individual uh, in 1847 we have sir james simpson yes he actually got knighted by queen victoria uh, and you don't have to write sir though you can just write simpson um and he was doing what you usually do on a Sunday night, sniffing chemicals with the boys. Uh, he was sitting there sniffing them. And they discovered chloroform because they were sniffing their chemicals and suddenly they were passed out. And then they woke up a few minutes later and they were like, hey, why did we pass out? And they picked up the chemical and they were like, I named this chloroform. Uh, so he's found an anaesthetic and... It was not life-saving because it led doctors to trying to attempt riskier surgeries, which meant more blood loss. And then in the 1870s, it's what? It's called a black period of surgery. That's a key term, black period of surgery, cause, since more people died because of the use of anaesthetics. Uh, before this, they were using ether, but ether is flammable. So it wasn't ideal, and they were also using laughing gas, but laughing gas made people vomit and giggle while they were getting their surgeries done. So it also wasn't very ideal, which led to chloroform being the best solution. Although, if you gave too big of a dose, it killed the patient. So, we introduced Jon Snow again, uh, who made an inhaler to regulate the amount of chloroform being used. Then we introduced, back again, Joseph Lister. 
Joseph Lister introduced the use of carbolic spray to spray on the wounds, which introduced aseptic and antiseptic surgery. They sprayed the carbolic spray on the wounds, but they also sprayed it on the bandages so that when they wrapped them up, it would disinfect the cuts. Uh, patient death rate fell, uh, his patient death rate fell from 46% to 15%. That's a pretty big jump. Uh, but people were complaining because people do love to complain, especially if you're living in Britain. Uh, doctors complained that the, uh, the carbolic spray was drying out their hands and it had an odd smell. And doctors said if it's drying up their hands, then it obviously can't be too much good for the patient. Uh, but Joseph Lister still encouraged people to use it. He didn't really explain why it worked, but he just said use it. Uh, but he himself stopped using it in 1890. Uh, so obviously, if you're not using it, if you, who was encouraging it before, is not using it anymore, then obviously people aren't going to use it. But this is okay, because Joseph Lister showed people that they needed to get their shit together and stop being so dirty while doing surgeries. Uh, and by the 1900s, this caught on, and people started steaming medical instruments, uh, they steam cleaned them, operating rooms and operating theatres were scrubbed clean, um, and rubber gloves and surgical gowns and masks were worn while doing surgery from the 1900s onwards. Uh, then we have James Morrison. He isn't a key individual, you don't really need to know his name at all, you can put Morrison in there if you want, uh, but he had cure-alls. Uh, in 1834, he was sell he was selling one million boxes per year, uh, and his cure alls uh, cure alls were things that were believed to cure everything. Uh, it contained lard, wax, turpentine, which you should never ingest. Take it from me; I use it for my paintings. Soap, and ginger. Doesn't seem very curey, does it? Um, anyway, by the uh, 1880s, uh, there were no laws on manufacturing standards, but people were like, hey, this needs to change. So they did introduce a law, uh, and it controlled uh, harmful ingredients being used. Uh, so Morrison just stopped using soap, and then he left his other ingredients, and people still bought it. So I guess people were desperate. Then we have hospital, hospital cares and its problems. Uh, hospitals at this time were cramped, stuffy, and they had sewage system problems. Uh, there was really packed poor sewage, uh, there was infections, and the death rates were high, and people complained that nurses themselves were dirty and drunk all the time. Uh, but in 1854, Crimean War happened. Now, do you remember who our key individual for is for the Crimean War? Florence Nightingale, uh, the creepy woman with the lamp. Uh, but also, do you remember that creepy video where she's sitting there like this? And she's like running around, she's like, I did not want to be a housewife, I wanted to help people. Uh, so yeah, she ran off to war and she became a nurse. Nurses at this time didn't have much training, they didn't even have a school. But we'll get to that later. Uh, Nightingale cleaned uh, the wards, scrubbed them, uh, swept them, made uh, open windows, so made sure there was ventilation, cleaned the sheets, and made them good food. And uh, she wrote a bunch of books after this on how to treat patients and how to become a nurse. And she also opened a nursing school in London. I believe it was the first nursing school. Uh, and the survival rate increased uh, by two thirds and the death rate dropped from 40% to 2%, which is a ginormous difference. <laughs> that is a 38% decrease. Uh, anyway, Back on to rich people. So rich people at this time, they weren't going to go to hospital. Hospital was for the poor people who can't afford it. So they just got a doctor to come to the house and treat them. Uh, and by the 1900s, there were 300 cottage hospitals. Uh, so cottage hospitals were local hospitals and the cottage hospitals obviously treated the poor people. Uh, then we have the government. The government at this time stopped taxing soaps so that people could actually clean themselves. Uh, they introduced fines uh, 
fines to enforce uh, uh, fines for failing to vaccinate a child, uh, and this was in 1871, so vaccines kind of became compulsory. Uh, and they made sewers. They were like, you need to build sewers. So they built sewers. Uh, and then we have the Public Health Act of 1875. Uh, so the Public Health Act of 1875 was introduced due to uh, Pasteur's germ theory, uh, and it made all the things from made all the things from 1848. I was going to say 1845, 1848 compulsory. So now all the things from the 1848 public health act is compulsory uh, so 1875 they made those compulsory and they fixed the sewage systems they improved water supply uh, they regulated doctor qualifications why weren't they doing that before uh, they made food regulations uh, also on the cure rules um, and they made a law against river pollution so you could no longer dump your feces and shit into the river this is because there was it was a great stink um, and the Thames got really stinky. So when the House of Lords were in Parliament, they were like, Ew, this stinks. Uh, so they did it more for themselves. And to combat this, they actually uh, put a mild form of bleach on the curtains so that they could smell that and get high off those chemicals instead of smelling the absolute disgusting smell of shit in the Thames. You don't need to know that. That it's always a nice sprinkle of information and some background information that I know. Um, this, these new things prevented the spread of disease um, and they also combated the filthy living conditions of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and since there was proof of bacteria, people were now believing it. Um, and politicians also wanted to appeal to the working class because the working class now have the vote. And if the working class have the vote, but the nobility aren't looking after them, then they're not really going to vote for them, are they? But if you're starting to help the working class people, then of course they're going to start. They're going to start being like, "Hey, I'll vote for you if if you help me." So yeah, that was seventeen hundreds to nineteen hundreds. That is Georgian to Victorian. And after this, we're going to have the Western Front, and then we're going to have modern medicine. Great. We're three in. Happy history revising. <laughs>